Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Roundtable's hands-on training workshop on how to get ROI from your ECA. Our speaker today is Alex Corey, partner and director of eDiscovery at Smith Gambrell and Russell. And our sponsor is Thompson Reuters and eDiscovery Point. Remember, the Roundtable workshops are not intended to be a sales pitch or a demo. Rather, they are an opportunity to test drive a technology that provides a solution in relation to today's legal topic. At the end of the workshop, you'll receive a short survey from Jeannie, our operations manager, and we ask that you please take a couple of minutes to provide us with feedback on the format of the workshop. Please also let us know about legal technologies and topics that you'd like to see in future roundtable workshops. At this time, please disable your video and mute yourself. If you have any questions or technical issues during the workshop, please contact Nicholas Balthazar or Jeannie via Zoom chat. And with that, We'll hand the presentation over to Alex Corey. Thank you, Melissa. And a special thanks to RPC Strategies and to Thompson Reuters for hosting this uh, forum on early case assessment. I really do think this is an important stage in the e-discovery process and, and maybe one that doesn't get as much attention. And so it's, I think it's um, wonderful that you guys have created this forum for us to discuss uh, what is what is a grow increasingly important topic. So we're gonna talk about how to get ROI from your ECA. Uh, and what we mean by that is how, how exactly to use ECA uh, to, in order to get the best return on your investment. And as we get started, let me talk, just set the stage by defining exactly what we mean by ECA. ECA stands for Early Case Assessment. Uh, and it really is sort of a pre-review stage of data analysis uh, that probably a lot of you, you are already using uh, and hopefully this presentation will either inspire you to use it if you aren't, or give you some ideas, new ideas on how to, uh, tactics you can use to improve your ECA. So we're gonna start off, uh, this is a little bit of an agenda. We're gonna start off talking a little bit about the state of e-discovery right now and why ECA is, is more important now than ever. Uh, we're gonna talk about avoiding process failure, which is one of the great benefits I think ECA uh, gives. And then we'll talk about some basic tactics and some more advanced tactics in ECA. And finally wrap up with sort of an evolving way of using ECA to stage the review in order to help limit review costs. So let's get right into it. First of all, state of e-discovery. Where, where are we? Where do things stand? We know that the federal rules of civil procedure were amended in December of 2015. One of the reasons for the amendment or one of the intended purposes of it was to help reduce the rising uh, number of e-discovery cases that were clogging up the court system. And the, th the theory was that if there were some guidelines, some rules to follow, uh, and of course the amendments encour encouraged judges to get involved more early in the case, or earlier in the case, uh, that e-discovery litigation would actually uh, go down. As we can see from this chart with the number of e-discovery cases uh, in the, over the past decade, the number actually went up and went up dramatically after 2015. Um, and although there's some evidence out there that some of the more severe sanctions, such as adverse inferences or dismissals are, are generally down, the, the actual amount of litigation on e-discovery issues has increased. And with increased litigation, of course, comes increased risk, which is why I think ECA is more important now than ever. It's a great way to sort of uh, hedge your bets against some of those, some of the risk of e-discovery. So what, what would we mean by return on investment? This means what are the benefits and how do we weigh that against the cost of ECA? Uh, and ECA costs different amounts, depends on your, depends on what you're doing it, how, how you're doing it, what, who your vendor is. Um, you know, there are a lot of variables. Some vendors uh, will give you ECA at a reduced hosting cost. Some of them will even uh, host for free, uh, which is a, you know, sort of a wonderful benefit to you. It allows you, gives you a, a low cost repository to keep your data in and and basically use that time to do some analysis to gain early intelligence on your case. Uh, it's very effective for spotting holes in your ESI collection, which is a great way to avoid that litigation down the road. You can see um, the oversights that you may have made before your opponent uh, gets to discover that. It also, and this is sort of the more traditional use of it, it allows you to reduce volume of documents to be hosted, uh, which is the greatest sort of cost reduction in e-discovery e that there is. Uh, and it also enables targeted and prioritized review and that there's a lot of benefits to that. We'll talk about that in a little more detail later in the program. But at the end of the day, what we're really talking about is reducing the cost of document review, which is still the largest single cost in discovery uh, in most cases today. 
and it reduces the risk of sanctions. So generally speaking, uh, early case assessment is a, is a great investment. Um, it is a, um, it, there's, it's not free, especially if you use some of the analytics, there may be some additional cost to that. But in my experience, at least, it has always been a good investment, one that we felt like delivered great value for our, for our spend. <clears throat> And so ECA, I like to think of it as an e, as an e-discovery sandbox. This is a place where we can get in and play with the data in a safe environment. We can run tests, we can do um, keyword search reports, and we can look at some of the documents. It's not as robust as a review platform. Uh, usually ECA is a database that has, it, it has the data, it has the information from the documents, but the, the documents haven't been imaged yet. So it's not as pretty as a review platform, but we can learn a lot about our documents in this environment and we use it as a place to use trial and error to catch our mistakes to spot uh, gaps in our collection and to learn about the case uh, really it is if you think about the name early case assessment it's something that you do early in the case to understand the value of um, of your case what are your arguments uh, do they pan out do the documents support them uh, there's a lot of benefits for looking at your data early before the discovery phase and that's what eca is for most importantly, it allows us to avoid making representations to the, to the opposing party or to the judge that don't pan out. And that happens quite a lot if you haven't looked at your documents before you start uh, making assessments of what discovery will look like for you. So when we talk about process failure, and what I mean is this, there, this is the EDRM model for e-discovery workflow. And it's pretty standard. This is generally accepted as the workflow and ECA falls in this model uh, in, in that processing and a analysis uh, box in the blue, right in the middle, uh, which it seems unusual. We say early case assessment, uh, but it looks like in, in, in the EDRM model, at least ECA usually falls in sort of the middle of that workflow. And I find this to be not particularly helpful to help litigators who are not extremely well versed in e-discovery to think about ECA. And so what I did was I, I sort of superimposed some of the EDRM stages onto more of a a true litigation timeline. And so that's what you see here. And essentially we start with the timeline with the complaint. It could be any sort of notification that you discover that uh, litigation is, is forthcoming, such as a demand letter or a subpoena. But we'll just put complaint to make it easy. The first stage of course is identification, figuring out the first thing you're gonna do is figure out who your custodians are, where their documents are kept, uh, and you're gonna try to define a timeline. That's gonna be the scope uh, and you want to cast a broad net here, of course, uh, so that you can move into the next stage, which is preservation, litigation, hold letters, custodial interviews, identifying the universe of documents and preparing for the collection process. Now I have the answer coming next. I mean, sometimes we, I try to collect documents before we answer if we can, it's not always possible. I think this is more typical, but it's, it's not a hard and fast timeline. You want to try to do the e-discovery steps uh, at the same time, sort of concurrently with the more traditional litigation um, procedural steps. But I will say, so you'll see ECA falls in right after collection. And whether it, you do your ECA before the answer or after the answer, it's important to try to do it before you do the 26F conference and before you start drafting ESI protocols. And one of the things that concerns me in practice is I see a lot of attorneys who are, are essentially exchanging or drafting almost stock ESI protocols before they've looked at their client's data, which, which, which is a recipe for disaster. I mean, it's, it's either going to, you're either going to have an ESI protocol that is so vague or in specific that it doesn't help much in guiding the process, or you're going to make promises uh, in the ECA protocol that you end up being disadvantageous for your client. So ECA before the 26F conference, is important to me because it lets you understand what your data, what your client's data looks like, uh, what the strengths and weaknesses are. It gives you some sense of what the keyword, potential keywords are going to be and what the volume of those keywords are going to be before you make agreements with opposing parties. So ECA before 26F, before the ESI protocol is where you'll get the most value. Now, of course you, do, you can do it later and sometimes facts dictate that it happens later, just the way it works. but the most value for your ECA investment will come the earlier you can do it in the case. So we've talked about sort of when to do ECA. Let's talk a little bit about how. The basic traditional, I'll call it ECA tactics are deduplication, email thread suppression, domain culling, date range limitations, and keyword searching. And 
almost everybody has is, is, is using these steps or at least some of them i'm just going to go over them some of the basics this is these all of these techniques are really designed to reduce volume of document hosting which reduce your cost um, and not just the hosting but also reducing the review cost and so that's a it's perceived as sort of the greatest value of ECA and I, I would have to say it probably still is but as we see later there's some other benefits as well but let's talk about some of these basic cost saving techniques uh, for using uh, your ECA process so the first one is deduplication it's pretty simple I mean the problem that you're trying to solve here is that you've got your your document collection is bloated because of there are so many duplicates uh, and that's especially the case when you're dealing with ESI. Uh, it has a tendency to, to replicate itself um, over and over and over again, when, especially when you're collecting from a lot of custodians. And so deduplication is just an automated way to eliminate the duplicates from your data set. And some vendors will deduplicate at the time of processing, in which case the duplicates never hit your ECA database. And some vendors will deduplicate in ECA bef before you move the documents into your review platform. The greatest cost reduction is if you can do it during processing, um, but you definitely should do it before you promote documents into your review platform, just because that reduces cost. The review platform uh, is what we t generally think of. Um, there are a lot of different platforms out there. I'm not gonna promote any particular one, but that's the database where we get to tag documents, make notes, uh, do redactions. There's lots of functionality there, but you pay a premium for that hosting. And so getting the duplicates out before you put the data into that environment is a great way to reduce cost. It's important when you do this that you're not reducing relevant content. Um, and so in the, to the right, you'll see I've just sort of put just standard deduplication uh, phraseology that I use in a lot of ESI protocols that basically says that although we're eliminating the duplicates, we are going to keep track of uh, the other custodians who help, who had a copy of the document. And that's generally important because parties need to know uh, for deposition prep, you know, which witnesses had which documents in their possession. And when you deduplicate, sometimes that's hard to follow if you're not tracking that. It's, it's an easy enough process, just something that you need to instruct your vendor to do when they deduplicate. The next step is email thread suppression. I think most people understand email thread suppression. There are lots of emails. The emails get sent back and forth. Uh, it creates these long chains of largely duplicative information. So again, the issue here is redundant information that's bloating your, your document collection. And so email thread suppression basically takes the computer, takes those email threads, identifies them and sorts them into you know, the most inclusive versions of that conversation. So that instead of having a hundred documents or a thousand documents, you have three, four or five that if you read through them, will have all of the content of all of the other documents. It's a great um, a way to reduce volume. We typically see 10 to 30%, depending on how, many, how much email collection you have, uh, but a great way to uh, reduce volume and, and reduce cost. I will say that from a, again, it, it depends on how you instruct your vendor to, to conduct email thread suppression. Some vendors will only thread when they're promoting to the review platform and what will go into the review platform is not just the final version, but all of the uh, less the lesser inclusive emails as well. And so you don't get the benefit of the volume reduction. Now you, it's usually set up so that you're only reviewing the final most inclusive versions, but the the lesser inclusive versions are also in your database. And I like to instruct the vendor to keep those lesser inclusive emails back in the ECA database so that I'm not paying full price to host them in review and we're not getting rid of them they're still in the eca uh, platform and that's one of the great benefits of that platform is it is a, a great place to hold documents that you don't need um, at a reduced hosting cost culling by file type this is uh, another way to sort of look at your data and understand what it is that you want to review uh, and sort that out uh, before you put the data into your review platform uh, so basically here we're looking at custodial data this is our custodian here is andy zipper and the types of documents that we've collected from Mr. Zipper. And what we do here is we find the documents that we are most interested in, Microsoft Outlook notes, those are emails. So we definitely wanna look at those, maybe Word documents, only promoting those files that we think are gonna be relevant to the case. And this, this type of culling is particularly useful when dealing with personal devices, which can be filled with lots of files that we're not interested in, such as family photos or videos, music, uh, ebooks, 
all to all sorts of things. And so only advancing to your review platform, the file types that are potentially relevant to your case is, is, is another culling method that can help save costs and a great benefit in ECA. Domain culling, one of my favorite, this is primarily an email. This is an email culling technique. Uh, once you've run your searches, you know, your keyword searching, for instance, I mean, keyword searching is imprecise. Uh, as most everybody has experienced, you get a lot of, it's, it's generally over-inclusive, you get a lot of junk. And domain culling is a great way to eliminate that uh, in a hurry. So what, essentially what we do is we list all of the email domains that appear in our data set with the volume, and we look for the easy deletions. And so for this example, you know, let's assume that emails from Walmart and Amazon and risingphoenix.guru are not gonna be relevant to our case. And so in a matter of seconds, we've eliminated, uh, you know, almost 700 or almost 400 emails, which is, you know, between six and eight hours of review. So it's a very efficient way to get documents out of your review set. We also use this actually as a great benefit to us in helping with the pre review because most of the law firms, uh, lawyers and law firms that are emailing have domain names that identify them. So even though you may not know all of the lawyers who've been emailing your client, you, know, you can look at the domains and help help you find those. <clears throat> That's great for controlling costs as well, because we pull those directly into our privilege review uh, workflow so that they don't go through sort of first pass review. If you're using multiple passes of review, you know, getting them out of that first pass and directly into your domain review is a great way to help save costs on, on document review. Date range and keyword calling, pretty basic. Everybody gets this. You know, you run your keywords within the relevant date range and you get a subset of documents that you think are likely or potentially privileged. The challenge with keyword culling in that way is that keywords are incredibly imprecise. That just there's so much nuance in, in, in language and the potential for misspellings and just failing to put a space between words. There are lots of things that can go wrong with uh, keyword searching. And the great benefit of ECA here is not the, the ability to do the keyword searches, although that's uh, wonderful. You can do that in the review platform as well. The benefit of ECA is that the big circle here, the big blue circle, the, the leftover, the documents we don't wanna see are still active and available in ECA at a much lower hosting rate or, or free if you're lucky enough to have that type of an arrangement. And so if you discover later that you've, um, you know, the, the scope has changed or there's a keyword that you didn't think about or a particular custodian has a habit of misspelling a certain word that you were searching for. You can go back to your ECA database, run as many searches as you want, find those documents and promote them to review. Uh, and and so, it's, so it's a cost efficient way to get a do over on keyword searching. And so those are the basics and there's a great value in that. If that's all you used your ECA for, you would get a great return on your investment because it, you will reduce your document review costs by more than you spend on ECA uh, in every case. Now, some of, the, some of the more advanced techniques in ECA, and this is, these techniques are coming more into play as the technology, the software evolves, the analytics in particular, uh, being able to learn about your data. And there's a great benefit here, finding out if your theories of the case are supported by documents or if the opposing party's theories are supported by documents. Um, you know, figuring out whether you've missed steps in your collection. Knowing that type of information is incredibly valuable. Uh, it depends case by case on whether you are willing to pay for that uh, those analytics, but we find them to be generally a good investment, particularly with uh, larger collections. So let's talk about some of these techniques. Uh, timeline analysis is pretty straightforward. What you see is, is what you get here. Um, you know, this basically shows you how the documents that you've collected are distributed over timeline. Uh, this is, can be valuable for a lot of reasons. This, this is an actual case that I'm showing you. And this one's particularly relevant, uh, I thought, because we, our client basically told us that they did not have any emails before 2010. That's when they switched over their emails to a new server. They didn't have anything pre-2010 and we were prepared to go uh, make that representation to the opposing party. Uh, but we did our ECA first and we discovered lo and behold, we have emails from 2006, 2007 and 2009 in our collection. How did that happen? And by catching that, we were able to drill in, go look at those emails. Uh, they were all from a couple of custodians in particular. So we were able to follow up and figure out why we have 
their emails that predate the company's e current email server. Uh, in this case, they, these are in the custodians who had saved their emails into a project management platform uh, that, that what they thought were relevant to the project. And so we had, to, we had to massage our story a little bit about the email collection, uh, but at least it, it, allow, it allowed us to avoid sort of putting our foot in the mouth and saying that we didn't have any emails pre-2010. If you drill down, you, and you can drill down very granularly on the timeline analysis, um, here, what you're seeing are what we think are, I think is telling here is our gaps in your email collection. And this is sort of what I talk about using ECA to spot your um, process flaws, or errors, process failures. Now, these gaps that you see between uh, the email collections here are actually fall on weekends. And that's what you would expect to see when you're collecting work emails. But we've seen gaps that fall in periods where you would not expect to see one. And that can indicate a couple of things. Did you, um, is, was there a problem with the collection? Did you miss an important custodian? Uh, it can also identify spoliation. Has somebody deleted emails from a particular time uh, for a particular reason? And uh, you know, you can imagine how that's also incredibly useful, this type of analysis when you're getting the opposing parties production and, and go in and look for gaps in their production. But we use this in ECA to help us spot those flaws, oversights, gaps, or at least to understand what's going on. And if we need to go back and collect more documents or follow up with a particular custodian, we can do that before we've made our production. I always like to know where the problems are before my opposing party tells me. And this is a great way to do that. Heat mapping is a technique that is um, starting to use more and more. What heat, heat mapping does is it, uh, it identifies anomalies in word usage. So we, whatever word that you, uh, words you enter into the uh, tool, uh, it'll look for an unusual, unusually high um, uh, occurrence of that term, something that's unexpected. So again, here we see the email really existed, started around 2010. We put into some of the search terms that the plaintiffs were interested in just to understand and we didn't think we had a problem in our case, we wanted to understand if we did. And so what we found quite uh, quickly was that 2014 was a year of interest. There was a lot of, um, of heightened use of some of the terms that plaintiff was interested in in 2014. So it's just a way for us to sort of zero in, maybe we prioritize that year in our review so that we can understand, is this really a problem or is there some other explanation for why some of these terms are appearing in that particular time? It doesn't mean we won't review the other documents, obviously we will, but this is a great way for us to kind of figure out early on, is there, is there a problem that we don't know about? The communication constellations, this is a tool that we use a lot for in a lot of different ways. Um, again, it's process failure, making sure that we've identified the right custodians is our primary usage. So once we've sat down with, a, with our client and sort of figured out the custodians we think are most important, we, we collect their data, put it into the ECA platform, and then look at these communication constellations. And, and what we usually find is that there are two or three other employees who were looped in on a lot of these conversations, and they would be represented by one of the little dots here. And uh, we, can, we know, hey, this person is probably a custodian we should have collected, and we go back out and collect it. Another way that this is very useful is you learn about email addresses that you didn't know about. And so sometimes your custodians are sending emails to a work address or to somebody outside of the company and are sending emails, I mean, from a work address to their home address, to a Gmail or Yahoo, and they don't disclose that to you. They show, those things show up here. And so we're able to identify um, all of the email domains that are hitting our relevant custodians. Now here, the two sort of whited out dot coms are our client and a co-defendant. And so you would expect to see a bunch of those, but some of the dots farther out um, are always interesting, very telling um, about who's sort of communicating outside of the expected loop. And this is a, a great tool to use um, when also looking at your opposing parties production. So uh, useful information here for sure. Clustering, concept clustering, a lot of the AI software out there and analytic tools have been doing concept clustering for a while. It's starting to hit uh, to be used in ECA more. Uh, it, it primarily is a, is a great way to sort of learn about the language of your documents. I think we spend a lot of time 
theorizing over what would make a great search string and using search terms. And it's largely an academic exercise because we're in our heads thinking about what terminology the employees or the cl our client would have used. And what clustering does is, is it allows uh, the computer does a much broader search. So essentially taking the actual language that's in the data set and making connections between the terminology um, and creating clusters based around concepts. So you've got two, I showed two different tools. We use multiple tools, so I'm not promoting any particular one, um, but these tools are a couple of different ways of grouping documents together based on uh, recognizable concepts. So on the right, you see bubbles. Uh, for instance, all documents that mention or relate to Texas will be under the Texas bubble. And so if Texas was relevant or of interest to you, now you can find anything uh, from addresses uh, that involve Texas to news articles about the Texas Rangers to uh, anything related to Texas would be there. But you can, uh, you know, you can use these to help you sort and identify documents and you can even create your own clusters. And on the left is a cluster wheel, which just shows you how certain uh, terminology uh, relates to other terminology in your data set. This is a great way to help you sort of craft search term, uh, search term strings as well. So useful, useful tools for sure. Now, I will tell you that primarily where this is clustering is becoming more useful is in staging review. We're able to sort of identify the topics that are of the most interest, the hot topics, and promote those to review first. And so I want to segue there to sort of the closing here, which is how do we use ECA to stage review for cost reduction purposes? And what you see here is basically a, a chart that shows, that com compares three ways to approach the same 100 gigabytes of data. And what I consider the, I, I won't call it old because not everybody has done this way, but what, what I see frequently still are people, attorneys who will collect the client's data, put it all immediately into a review platform and then leave it there for the duration of the case. And as you can see, what you would expect to see is that there's just a straight uh, incline in, and cost in that scenario. That is probably the least efficient way. Now, if you've made a broad collection, uh, it, there's low risk, but there's high cost. If you use your ECA database, the, the yellow and green lines both, both represent ECA. And here's where we've used an ECA database to cull the data. So we've got the same collection of data. So our risk, we know our risk is low because we collect, we can collect broadly in ECA at a lower cost. And then we use the ECA to cull those documents. So although we have all the documents still, the only ones that are hitting the review platform where the billing charges are highest are the ones we want to see. And that's the yellow line. So this, the yellow line represents an attorney who used ECA to cull out the duplicates, thread the emails, do some keyword and date range searching, and then take the results of that and dump all of that into the review platform. And you can see it's a great cost savings, but still not the most efficient way to run your document um, e-discovery. The green line is somebody who's very aggressively managing the database. And so they use ECA to do the culling and they use ECA to stage the review. So by promoting only those documents that they're, we're most interested in seeing, reviewing them, tagging them, doing all the things we need to do, and then moving that data when we're finished with it into a, another um, condition. Usually most vendors will offer you a cold storage or, or a near line storage option, which again is a much cheaper uh, hosting environment than the active re review environment. And that before we bring the next set of documents up, and so by moving documents in and out of the review platform um, into lower cost repositories, we're able to control the cost of the document review even more. So in the green line and yellow line, we, review, we are reviewing the exact same sets of documents, uh, but by staging it using our ECA and our near line or cold storage to stage the documents, uh, we're able to keep the cost even lower. So this is a way that I think you can really maximize the return on your investment in ECA. It's, it's something that is uh, gonna be, is a part of all of our workflows and is, is I think an incredibly good return on your investment. Okay. And so that's it for my presentation, but I'm always available, uh, happy to answer questions if you want to reach out to me. And at this point, I will turn it back over to Melissa uh, and to Thompson Reuters for the next part of the program. Thank you. Thank you, Alex, very much. Um, at this time, we want you guys to prepare yourself for the hands-on training exercise. Now, um, a few of you went ahead and registered. Um, most have not. 
go at, we have we have about five or 10 minutes built in right now for this transition. And so um, Sarah and Kyle with Thompson Reuters are gonna help. on Tuesday and Wednesday, you would have received um, an email from Thompson Reuters with credentials and instructions um, as well as a follow-up call from their team. So we need you to go ahead and take this moment now to find that email. Um, and there's a couple of links in there that are gonna let you um, open up the eDiscovery Point application and go ahead and you have a registration key. Um, I've already set myself up and a few others have too. The whole purpose of doing a workshop is this is not just a one-way dialogue CLE. This is not a demo. We have set this up intentionally for you to be able to walk through it with us. We're going to do this together right now. Um, so take a moment and look for that email. Um, Sarah and Kyle are available for the next five to 10 minutes during this transition to help you get set up. Um, you're welcome to open up your videos, um, use the chat. Um, so let's do that now. Um, Kyle and uh, Sarah, if you guys kind of want to jump on and let's see about getting people um, set up. And I can also go ahead and share my screen um, so you can watch me walk through. Thanks, Melissa. We'll, we'll give them just a few minutes. I, I want to reiterate, though, if, if you if you aren't signed up or um, you know, you, you just want to follow along today, that's perfectly fine. You're going to have credentials to eDiscovery Point for the next five days. Uh, so if you wanted to kind of go through the little uh, demonstration that we're going to do with Melissa in just a little bit, um, kind of take some notes. Uh, you're welcome to go in at any point into eDiscovery Point and kind of walk around uh, to kind of see what's going on in there. I think Alex set a great table uh, for early case assessment and how you can actually save money uh, by using tools that are gonna call your, the, the, the universe of your documents down. I think all of us today have, you know, we, we, we want to cast this wide net for data. We wanna feel safe. Um, and with early case assessment tools, it makes that a bit easier because we can cast that wide net and then we can roll through and, and find the actual data that we need. Now at Thompson Reuters, eDiscovery Point has our data assessment tool that we're going to walk through, and I'm going to walk through a few points in just a second. Um, but I just want to make note that, you know, at Thomson Reuters, what we're doing with early case assessment is allowing you to do that and work through your data uh, at no cost. So, you know, we, we want to make sure that you're able to find the, the data that's relevant and not be invoiced for the data that's irrelevant. So that's how we work. Uh, and our tool, eDiscovery Point, uh, lets you work through the data and decide what's important. Uh, and that data is always going to be there as well. So if you need to go back and actually look through the data, um, you know, how many times have you been in a review and you're three weeks into the review and you find a new name or a new term that you might have to go back and look at, well, we give you the ability to do that in what we call our pre-review phase. So we'll be showing you a little bit of that. Um, as we walk through the steps of ETA. And then I'm going to put Melissa on the spot. Melissa has been um, out of the game for a little bit, and, uh, you know, there may be some new things in eDiscovery. So I'm going to put her on the spot a little bit. I'm going to have her log in to eDiscovery Point, and I'm actually going to walk her through some of the elements of early case assessment in the tool and allow you to walk through those with her as well. Again, if you can log in and, and share dual screens and, and walk along with us, please feel free to do that. But if you can't today, that's fine. Um, you'll have some time to work through that. You'll actually have my information at the end of this slide as well. If you want to give me a call while you're looking through it, if you don't understand something or want to see how something works, please feel free to do that. I'll give you just a couple more minutes for those. If anyone's signing in, uh, we'll just give you a couple more minutes, and then I'll uh, start a very brief slideshow uh, with just some of the highlights of ECA, and then we'll jump right in and put Melissa on the spot. I'm going to actually call on Doug Austin and put him on the spot, too, because I'm excited that Doug's here. Um, Doug mm -hmm. is the quintessential e-discovery media blog guru in the entire industry, and I'm super excited he's here and a friend. Um, I love being friends with him, but I know that Doug is also, um, he's got his account set up, too, so... Um, I'm excited to share it. <laughs> You're welcome, Doug. I think Doug's just one of the most amazing human beings I've ever met, and I've just really enjoyed working with him. Um, he, uh, 
I'm reading the chat. I shouldn't be doing that. Um, Doug actually worked for um, a, an e-discovery provider a few years ago when I did the round table before I had to take some time off. And um, uh, we worked on a workshop together and that was a lot of fun. So it's been nice to stay in touch. So I'm glad Doug's here. And I see Mark Michaels. Uh, Mike, Mark is um, a law school out in California and we've started some dialogue over the last year about um, providing better education and opportunities like these hands-on training and you know, test driving opportunities for law school students because law schools have um, failed uh, greatly in really providing better education and training with the legal technologies to the students. So Mark is one of a few that I know within the law school environment that's spearheading efforts to change that. So excited to see Mark here. And uh, Laverne, I don't know if you remember me, but I remember you. I, uh, I worked at Sorodium Permit years ago when I was a legal secretary and a paralegal. So I'm um, excited to see you too. Um, and I see a couple of repeat uh, people. Juan, it's good to see you. Uh, Juan's been at our workshops before, so it's nice to see you here again. Um, so, oh, you guys are welcome. You're sweet. Thank you. It's good to see y'all. I'm glad you're here. All right. All right. Well, thank you. So how about we get started? Uh, hopefully we've give, given people enough time to go ahead and get that in. If, uh, if not, again, we can work, uh, work after the fact. But um, let's start talking about, you know, Thomson Reuters eDiscovery Point and our data assessment tool that's built into our review and production tool um, and how, you know, we can use that. I promise this would be brief. Uh, we're going to walk through some uh, some objectives. This is a class today. We're actually walking through some things, so I'm very excited to be able to do that. Um, our goals are going to be to just navigate the data assessment tool that we have inside of eDiscovery Point. We have different views that we can view data, so I can see a custom field view. So you know now when we load data, uh, we get a lot of metadata that comes along with it for the ride. Uh, we're able to put that in a database where we can actually you know, look inside of those fields and find out what's in there. We can find out what type of files we have, uh, for instance, find out who our custodians are because we've added that custodian field. We have a PST view. So we can load PST files, which is email, uh, and, you know, those typically break out into smaller MSG files, but we can actually look inside the person's email box to see, you know, what, what folders have they created uh, within their email. You know, how are they organizing data and how can that information be important to us? Uh, I use the analogy that, you know, we may not need to see or we may not need to look at the data in a folder uh, that's, that's uh, you know, has the tag grandma's 99th birthday photos. But there are other ones we might need to see. So we can include and exclude data uh, within that view. We can look at the source path. We can see where that data came from, where it was on the server, where it was on the laptop or even a phone. So we can see, you know, how deep it was, uh, what the folders were that were named that the data belongs to. We can under we're going to understand how to create a search report and read the results. So you can search. Obviously, we're Thomson Reuters Westlaw. We work in search. Um, we can search different ways. Um, and that's all driven by the way data is presented to us now, especially with email. You know, we have our, our, our email is called our parent, and our, the attachments that come along with that email for the ride are called the children. Um, so we call those families. So when we're working with families, that can sometimes skew the search results that we get. So we may put in a search term and get 10 hits back from that we get 27 documents because they're attachments and we don't wanna pull those attachments apart. We kinda of wanna keep those together for the most part. We can promote documents to in review status. Now in review is important in eDiscovery Point because that's where our billing starts. We allow you to load data into you know, that pre-review status to, to look through it, to use your early case assessment, to use searching, and then only promote the data that you need to that's relevant to you uh, into what we call review. Now, one of the biggest secrets, or maybe not the best kept secrets in the e-discovery world, is we actually allow you to promote things or demote things back to pre-review if you need to. We understand that we get, you know, we get false hits sometimes. Uh, we may need to send those back, so we allow that flexibility. We may create and manage some assignments along the way too. We can actually pull data uh, and we may want to assign that to one person. I don't personally know anyone that likes to look at spreadsheets, but we could certainly do that. We could say, 
Uh, Dave down the hall, here's a thousand spreadsheets you get to code, you get to review through. So we can create assignments uh, in this tool as well. Now the e-discovery workflow is fairly simple. You set up a new matter. We've set up new matters for those of you who are logged in and you can log into those matters just by clicking on the left-hand side or the name of the matter. We upload and process the data at the same time. So obviously we're a cloud-based application. So when you drag and drop your data into eDiscovery Point, it processes. So that's our first culling. That's actually our first ECA piece. We're culling that data based on deduplication, like Alex pointed out, uh, that will take your, you know, your, your larger set down. And that's the first thing it does. When we deduplicate or de this so we can actually take any known system files out of your upload as well. So we're going to give you a, a log that says, here's why we did that. And it's typically because it met a hash value um, trace. And we, the document has a certain hash value. If we see that again, that unique identifier, we know that's an exact duplicate. So we take that exact duplicate out. You don't have to review or do early case assessment on the same data over and over. Now, up there at the top is the really important part. That's where we actually perform that data assessment. We start looking through it. We decide what we actually need to promote to review. Once we promote it to review, we can code those documents, and then we can get them ready for production, where we can actually create a production tracking set as well. So we have both copies. We have the original and the production set track. So we can go back and forth. Uh, when we go to trial, we know we've got this certain set we can work on. So that's how eDiscovery Point works, a very simplified workflow, uh, but it gets you exactly to the data you need to review and gets you out of that mess of, you know, all of that false data we have to look through in some cases, all of those domains that we really don't need to look at that Alex uh, pointed out in one of his slides. Um, so it's a really, again, a simple workflow. I hope that you'll, you'll find it simple when you see it in, your, in the early case assessment piece that we're going to look at in a bit. Now, just to show you some, some screenshots of what you're going to see when you actually start digging into eDiscovery Point. I've put some red numbers on some of the icons that we have in our toolbar in our earliest early case assessment tool. Now, you'll see that we call it data assessment here uh, at this top ribbon. Same thing, early case, early data assessment. That's what we're doing in eDiscovery Point. You'll see a couple of things here at the top, a pre-review and an in-review toggle. So if you see those in the top left-hand corner, that's just where data starts out. Everything you load into eDiscovery Point starts in pre-review. We're going to decide using this data assessment tool what we're going to move over. So here's some of the views that you'll see when you first enter data assessment. If you'll see the number one, that's the custom field mode. That's where we can go enter information and to select the field to begin that you see on the left-hand side and say, show me the custodians that have been loaded. Now let's look at their file types. Now let's look at their file sizes. We can continue to filter this out as much as we want. There's number two is that PST mode. It's denoted by a little envelope there. We can view data in its Outlook folder structure like I talked about in the beginning. And this is at the time of collection. So when we load that PST file, hey, let's go in and look and see what kind of folders this person has, this custodian. Let's see what might, what we might want to include, but also what we might want to exclude. I mean, I don't want to see someone's fantasy football picks in a matter that has nothing to do with fantasy football picks, so we can look at that as well. Number three, the little uh, tri fork that you see there is just showing you the source path mode, so we can actually look in the data, again, see where it started, see what the path to that data is when it's uploaded. And the last thing, number four, there is a search hit report. Now, this can be very important when you're looking for ROI. You want to be able to see exactly how much data you're going to promote to review. Because, again, those searches can be skewed. They're going to show you uh, that, you know, you had 20 hits, but it might not be 20 hits that's coming along for the ride based on families that we talked about before with those parents and their attachments. Now, this is the data assessment assessment custom field view that we just talked about. So one, you can see that I hit, let's see who the custodians are. Two, I can see that this person has 177 Microsoft Outlook notes, which are actually emails. Now, if you look over to the right-hand side for the number three, that's where I can create an assignment. I can say, let's send this person's Microsoft Outlook emails to review. But let's go ahead and create an assignment and let someone we trust with looking at these things 
um, you know, take this on. So we can create an assignment per person. I could create an assignment if we had thousands of records going over by numbers. So if, we, if someone wanted to look at a thousand and that next person could look at a thousand, we can do that as well. Or I can just simply send them to review and we can create those assignments later. Now our search report and pre-review, we can create the search report we can manually add search terms by using a CSV file. I know a lot of people have just huge searches that are created. I mean, one of the first things that we always did when I was a director at a law firm was we would always search for our attorney names. So that may be a large search, but we can input that here. And we can import, again, import those search terms via CSV file, or you can just type them out if you need to. Now, importing search terms via a spreadsheet you need to save your file as a CSV. Some people do that as an Excel, but CSV actually works better. Now remember, you can use the search report in review as well. So it doesn't just work in our pre-review module. Now when we run that search, we actually create it. We create our words. You can see action and Andrea and ball. We can create you know, long Boolean searches if we want. And we'll actually go through that in our hands-on piece. And when we can run that report, and that report is going to give us the exact information that we're looking for. I can see the number of docs that the search hit on. I can see the family docs that were included. Then I can see the total of docs and family. And I can also see what didn't match with inside of our matter that we're working on. So this really tells us the story of how much data we're going to move over. And we can plan accordingly when we do that. We know that we've got this much data coming in. Uh, this is going to you know, uh, result in, in this much uh, data, the data size that's coming in, which will allow us to plan again accordingly as we move forward. Now within that search report, you know, docs, you can see there in the one bubble, you can see on two that we can send that to review or create those assignments again. You can view assignments already created for your matter, or you can create new ones. Now, before we get started and before we put Melissa on the big spot, on the big stage, I wanna just go over some key terms. And these key terms are, are e-discovery terms, but some are also e-discovery point terms. So when you hear me talking about pre-review versus in review, that just means when documents are uploaded and where they're going to start out when you log into EDP is on that left-hand toggle of pre-review. So in pre-review, you're gonna see those uploaded documents. You're gonna see a lot of information about them created in the metadata fields that came along for the ride. It's only when we promote data that you'll see it in the in review toggle, but that happens very quickly when we promote that data. So you can see it in, you know, pretty much instantly and you can go and start doing your coding, start doing your review and all of those things that you need to do to get ready for your productions. Now our data assessment tool is gonna to allow you to organize that data. You're gonna see that custom field view, PST view and source path and all those cool things that I've talked about in, the, in, our, in our slides going forward here, and assignments. You, know, you can create assignments to groups of people, or you, know, you can just not assign it and assign it manually if you'd like to as well. So there's a lot of ways we can work through the data. So I, again, that's the end of my brief presentation. I think Melissa is going to go ahead and bring up her e-discovery point at this point. I'm gonna stop my share and let you go ahead and do that, Melissa, and I'm gonna walk her through um, as a rookie, um, some of the things that she can do in an early case assessment and e-discovery points. Okay. All right. Everybody can see my screen? Looks good. Okay. All right. So one of the to note is you know, what you're seeing here is an e-discovery point. This is our one pass login. So some of the folks on the call may have other Westlaw products. They may, they may be uh, used to this. this. This is consistent throughout the product line at, at Thomson Reuters. So, you know, you're just given another, uh, another piece to add to add your e-discovery point login. So Melissa, if you want to go ahead, it looks like you've got your username and password in there already. All you need to do is sign in. Hey, Doug, I know that you're doing this too, so I'm going to call on you. You might want to unmute yourself. Okay, I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> I, all right. So you can, 
Yeah, you can see that Melissa has a couple of matters here. Most of you are only going to see one. I wanted to burden her with a couple, so she had to make a decision right off the bat. So she's <laughs> going to go into the roundtable admin um, matter that's created. Now, I want to say, before you go in, Melissa, I want to make a couple of points here. When we talked about the billing strategy that EDP uses, um, it's based on documents that are moved to review. So that's why in the middle you see the PR, the R, and the P. The PR just means this is the data kind of rounded uh, that's in pre-review now. Uh, in the middle there, what's been promoted to review? Well, we haven't promoted anything yet. And at the end, how many documents have been produced? We haven't produced any yet. And you can see some things like when it was started and all of that. So now if you hover over the name of the matter that you were given, you can actually click on that and you're going to go directly into that matter. Now, what's up? There are no documents in review. Well, if you go up into the left-hand side of the screen, you can actually toggle over to pre-review. And once you toggle over and click that, you're actually going to see uh, documents that were given a document number. You can see some of the metadata there that we've selected, maybe the name of the email or the file. You can see the custodian's name, which is in the middle. If we started coding this data now, you could see the responsive area. You could see the file type. We've got exception reasons, but this is all up to you. So if you go right above that exception reason um, and click that little icon, um, Melissa, it's just right there. That's going to give you the ability to put any column you want in this. And it's going to give you a list of columns that are there right now. For instance, we probably don't need exception reasons. Let's click and just click it over and let's get it off of our screen. So we can do that quite easily. Once we do that, you can just apply. And now that won't be one of the headers of the metadata that we've brought over with this data. Now, it's important to point out that data that, that gets this metadata treatment has to be native files. So if we're working with images like PDFs and TIFFs, they don't get a lot of this great information that we get from native files that allows us to do things like filtering and our early case assessment. Now, we can do some early case assessment on those image files, but remember, those are just pictures of documents. They're not, they don't have the metadata and the text layer that we get when we actually work with native files. That's why it's so important when we can collect data that way, we actually get native files uh, instead of images. Um, so we can get all this great information about, you know, is it an email? Is, you know, what's the name of the email? What's the date? All of those, all of those great things. Mm -hmm. So I wanna talk about some of the first things we can do to assess our data early without even going into data assessment. Now, if you'll, look at the top of the screen here, and Melissa will go over, you'll see what we call our data assessment ribbon. Now, you'll notice when she goes over that, it turns blue, and it's ready to go in and actually start assessing our data. Now, in pre-review mode, we can actually search our data as well. So, I'm going to go ahead and do just a couple of simple searches to show you, you know, how we can work with search terms as well, because it's a big part of what we do today. Um, we still do searches to call our data down. So, Melissa, if you want to just hit the uh, search um, button up there at the top, you see the little uh, magnifying glass, go ahead and click that. And this is just a quick search in EDP. This is just like you would search your own email. I do want to note, though, when you search this way, not only are you searching the document text, you're also searching any text that might be in any of the metadata fields. So you can see some fields there that have SEC panel, executive. Those words are going to come too. They may not be in the actual text of the document, but if they're the name of the document or something like that, we're going to bring those along. So let's go ahead and just search for the word humor. Um, Melissa, if you want to just pop that in, and if you go over to the right-hand side and you hit our little magnifying glass, that is searching the data that we have in pre-review and it's brought some results back. So someone has used the word humor at some point um, to, you know, in, in the text of the document, or it might even be the head, header name of the document you'll be able to see. So we want to take a look at this. We want to understand why, you know, understand where these search terms, are, why they're hitting, where they came from. So Melissa, if you go to the top box where you see the blue check box off on the first document, You'll see that on 153 there. Go one above that, one above, over on the left-hand side where you see the little checkbox. Oh, okay, right here. Right? All right. Yeah. So you check you them all. that highlight. Okay. So 
We're going to highlight everything, and now we're going to go all the way over to the right, and we're just going to send that to review. I want to take a look at that really quickly. Now, we can do a couple of different things here, but the one thing that I want to make sure that you understand is that little blue checkbox that says we're going to include family members. So when we include family members, again, we may get a little bit more than we're expecting. We may not. Uh, there are 37 items selected here. Let's see how many when we, we get when we actually send it to review, Melissa. So go ahead and hit the send button down at the bottom right-hand corner. Doug, I know you're working in a different matter um, and you're following along too. Um, what kind yeah. of results are you getting? Yeah, I've got the same, even though it's the different matter, it's the same documents that are being um, uh, pulled up in the search and I just sent it to review as well. So uh, I assume I'll get the same number you got. Okay. Awesome. So the first thing that the viewers will notice is on the screen, there are no documents in, in review now because those documents hit our humor uh, search. Now we actually have to toggle over into in review to see what documents have, have made it over into our review platform. And there you go. You see the same uh, metadata that came with it. Um, you can see all of that information. You can see that it was just 37 items. So we didn't have any emails or anything that came along with it. Now. Melissa, if you'll just hover inside of any one of the cells there for document 153 or whatever document you want to bring open, just go ahead and click it anywhere there. And let's look at the document and see what we got, uh, you know, based on the information that we gave it on the humor search. So go ahead and just click there, double click. Double click it, okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, notice the black ribbon on the top. There are search term matches in this document's metadata. That means the word humor was actually in one of the um, cells of data in the database. So that was probably the name of the file and, or something like that. And that's why you're getting that data. So this is why the data was moved over. Um, is it right there? Yeah, um, you could, probably, that's probably why it was in there. Yeah. Now, if you wanted to go from document to document, on the bottom right-hand corner, you'll mm -hmm. see some arrows and that right-hand arrow all the way to the right, Melissa, that'll actually take you to the next document. The one that says item, not page, because the pages are just for that that I have pulled up, but item, that's for the documents that are in this entire document set, right? Yep, that's what we call them, item. Okay. So go ahead and click to the next one. That's not really funny. Let's click to the next one. Now we can see some information here. Now scroll down on this document and you can do that by just picking the scroll bar there to the right, just like you're doing a great job. Okay, wait, let's see what we got there. We've actually got the word humor, even though we've moved it from pre-review to in review, it's still highlighting our search. Now, if there were multiple highlights in one particular document, I could use my global search term arrows up there on our toolbar to actually move from search to search. It may be the only one in here, but we can certainly oh, do that. There's a couple. No, there's a couple. Oh, awesome. So we can do that to see what we're looking for. Okay. So a very simple way to just get started. Let's see what we're looking for. Let's do a search. Let's just do a simple search here and let's move that data over, get it out of our pre-review. But let's say a couple of our documents just really didn't meet our criteria. If you wanna just pop on the document list once again, Melissa, which if you just go to the top there, you can bring the document list back up. Now I could create a coding panel or something to remind me, most people are gonna call data non-responsive. I could go filter for that at a later date, but if I just wanted to move a couple of documents back to pre-review, I can just check a couple of, couple off and send those directly back to pre-review. They're, they're false positives. I don't need them in here. I'm going to send those back. So we can do that quite easily. Uh, if you just hit send to pre-review back uh, on the right-hand side, we can send those pieces of data back. Now, why is this important? It's important because you don't want to be billed for that. Um, so once you send that back to pre-review, this is just a warning. If you did this, uh, we're going to remove the coding, but you really don't need it anyway because you're sending it back to pre-review. And then I can go right. back pre-review and see the, yeah, so like I actually want to, I want to echo what Kyle said earlier, because we've been practicing this workshop component for about four weeks and we went through it yesterday and um, he's right. Like I was a litigation paralegal for 11 or 12 years in the early part of my career, but I've been out of that for 15 years. And then I've done marketing and sales and I've, <clears throat> we've done a lot of these CLEs and workshops around table, but 
Um, and I've sold e-discovery in the past, but I had to take a professional sabbatical. I had some family things I had to deal with for two or three years and, and, and Doug knows I've known Doug for a long time. So I was kind of out of the game for a few years. And then when we got back into it and I was walking through this with Kyle, um, I, I was, it was really, it was really fun to get back involved in it again and to actually get my hands into a tool like this, um, and, and tinker around with it. And I had to mind Kyle yesterday because you know, we worked out certain things that we wanted to do in the workshop, but I got so excited about getting involved in it, but also because the tool itself was so user-friendly, um, as knowledgeable as I am in the career that I've had in eDiscovery, um, I'd been out of it for a while, like you said, and it was user-friendly enough for me to jump right in and figure out pretty quickly under his guidance um, and I actually kind of went off the rails a little, little bit yesterday. I started, cause it was so easy. I started looking at other things and I started coding and I did, started doing, you know, a variety of things that I know as a paralegal would have been helpful to me. Um, if, if I'd had technology like this, you know, a few years ago. So, um, I hope you're okay with me digressing just a little bit. Doug, do you have any, um, comments or feedback so far before we continue to move on? Um, yeah, ab absolutely. Um, I think one of the great things about kind of this flow here is uh, you're you're really uh, not sure what you're going to have at the outset that you're going to want to spend time on review. And so I like the idea that you can do some searches, you can pull some things over, you can start reviewing, you can probably then refine searches to pull things back, of course, and then that's the really the, the real key is less eyes on documents, uh, the better, and the less documents you have to truly load into the platform, the better. So it's nice that you've got that flexibility to pull them over and then move them back as you continue to refine the documents that you really uh, identify as uh, potentially responsive. Yeah, it, it's a huge improvement on, I know when I started, you know, when I was a paralegal, we didn't have e-discovery and we didn't have technology like this um, to manage our cases, manage our documents. And because I know I look old enough to be around that long, but whatever. Um, but then when I was selling e-discovery, I mean, you know, I was back in it at the beginning of it too, 15, 16 years ago, and it was so expensive and it was so cumbersome and it was just, it absolutely turned the legal industry on its head and it was overwhelming. Um, but the technology has just really improved a lot to, you know, and I, that's why I was excited about doing this um, with Thomson Reuters and with Alex, because the knowledge, the laws, the technology, we've had time to refine these things and it's, um, and I'm not pitching for anybody. I'm just saying this from personal experience. I've been around almost 30 years now. It's so nice to see this things like this needed to happen to manage documents, to manage data, to manage the cost so that we can get back to properly mitigating the actual issues and the damages and that the cost of e-discovery doesn't overwhelm the you know, the issues and the value of the case itself, because that's what's important. It's taking care of our clients and, you know, their unfortunate disputes. Your turn. <laughs> Definitely, Melissa. And I, I think, uh, you know, we've, we've moved some data back like we can, and we may be asking ourselves, why are only three documents showing up? Well, we need to get out of the search we were in. So if you go up to the search box where it says search with the little uh, arrow to the right-hand side of it, uh, one, one little spot over there, you can actually just clear all. So we'll clear the searches that we've created uh, there at the bottom, and then we'll get back into our data set that we're, uh, you know, assessing. Um, so let's do that now. Let's go into the data assessment tool by pop, you know, just clicking on the ribbon at the top that says data assessment. There we go. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we've got a blank slate now. We know we're working with, you know, how many documents we're working with, now let's go in and start calling this down as much as we can. So the first icon that you see, like we talked about in the uh, in the beginning, uh, over to the left, one more is the uh, is the you know the custom field view. So that's what we're in. So if you actually go into the little search box there below that, Melissa, mm -hmm. let's look and see what custodians we have. Now you can pick that out of the list, or you can just start typing. Now let's actually type the word custodian. So now let's go down there and click on custodians and let's see what we have in this particular set. 
smaller set here, we've got three custodians, Ken Lay, Matt Davis, and Stephen Keene. So let's take it another step. And let's go ahead up into your add another field box. And let's set file type. Let's see what type of files they have. All right, let's click that. And now we're breaking out all of those custodians based on the type of files that they have. So we've got some interesting folks here with Ken Lay. We've got some uh, Stephen Keen down at the bottom if you want to uh, pull the, the slide bar down to see what type of information that they have as well. So he's got a little bit more information, a little bit more data in here. So, you know, one of the, one of the, the file types that he has um, is Microsoft Excel spreadsheets. So if we highlight that Excel spreadsheet folder or, you know, the, the file type filter that's been created there, we can do a couple of things. I can send this entire, um, you know, all of the Excel spreadsheets directly to review. Or if I click on this, if you double click on this, Melissa, you can actually see the names of those spreadsheets. So I can do that a couple of ways. If the, you know, if you want to pull your little, uh, I, you know, take your header over, if you want to be able to see that a little bit easier, See those Excel spreadsheets? You can click them all if you wanted to, or you could pick and choose which ones you wanted to bring over. So, you know, if you want to pick a couple there, uh, three or four, we can actually send those directly to review based on their name. Um, so, yeah, go ahead and do that and just send it to review. Include those family members. We're always going to do that, so it may make our numbers a little bit different, but we're going to show you how to, to actually see that the right way every time in just a little bit. So we've moved some data over from Stephen Keen based on our data assessment on file types and on custodian. You can use any field available to you to do that type of, uh, you know, filtering. Now, if you want to pop back over to pre-review, Melissa, let's yeah. continue to get through the data that we're looking for. So we're going to go back in the data assessment ribbon. We've done some, some file type um, culling in a small way. Now let's, let's get out of that by just hitting our X on the right-hand side of the filters. We could continue to filter or we could just stop filtering from there. And let's hit our little envelope icon to the right of our data piece there. Yep, go ahead and click that. And now we're viewing the inside of a PST file. So instead of just seeing a bunch of messages uh, that we would have to go through and look at you know, in a linear fashion, we can actually see the PST files and the folders that were created. Now, if you go down a little bit, we might see a Ken Lay folder. Um, he's got some folders as well, or maybe we, did I not see that? The Enron PST, that was it. Go ahead and click that, uh, the little arrow there on the, yeah, there you go. Now, look at the Ken Lay. This is his Enron PST. Let's look at his folders. Now, I'm not real interested in uh, the SEC panel stuff, but what I might be interested in is the Enron folder that's there. So I can highlight that Enron folder, and instead of sending directly to review, we can actually create an assignment here to assign this data to someone on our team. So if you go ahead and click that, you can include the family documents exactly the way you want to. There at the bottom, we can assign this to one person. Now, if you want to go ahead and click next, okay. I can choose from there who gets to look at this. I can go ahead and pick myself yep, and hit next. And I can name the assignment Enron Doc, anything that you want to name it. Okay. Yep, and I can go ahead and assign that to me, or you can assign that to anyone on your team that you'd like. Now, when I come into EDP, I can go check out my assignments and say, oh, look, I get to look at Enron Doc. Everyone's dream. Okay. So just another way to, to get down to actually what we're looking for. I want to point out it's, it's, it's a nice way to exclude data as well. Think about all the things we're doing. Okay, I can bring an Enron folder over with its emails and its attachments, but I can also not bring things over because I realize that I'm going to be searching data. I'm going to be running these other, you know, file type assessments. I'm capturing, I'm, I'm posing a big net over all of this data um, to be able to, you know, to get to exactly what I need to get to. Now let's move over one more. Let's make sure we're back in pre-review. We move over one more. We can actually just look and see a, a source path. So if you want to click on that, you can. And now we can see we've got a folder structure. We've got a top folder, a secondary folder, a third level folder, and a fourth level folder. And when I click on that fourth level, level folder, 
I'm going to see some data in there. Um, so if you double click that, you'll see a couple of files. Um, we can see that, uh, you know, there are some, some files. Oh, there's the giant PDF final. We can move that PDF over if we want to. Um, that's just an article um, an amazing author wrote about the curse of the giant PDF and how we shouldn't collect data that way. So we can move that data over as well. Okay. So let's go to our last piece. Let's go back up to our data assessment. Okay. Okay. Let's go and look at our document list. Document list. We are. At what the are we bottom? Doing? You can bottom. document list. Oh, okay, right here at the bottom. Okay. Yeah, you're doing pretty good for your first time back in a long time. Um, so we were, you know, we were still in data assessment. So what I want you to do is I want you to just go up and click the name of the the uh, the the matter that we're working on, the roundtable admin. Okay. Yeah, just click that and pull us back in. That's going to pull us into review. But what I want you to do is just toggle back over to pre-review because we're going to do a search and then we're going to do a search report and show you the differences. So let's do an advanced search, Melissa. I want you to go back up to the search where you see the little magnifying glass all the way up at the top. I'm gonna I'm gonna go off the rails again because mm -hmm. I saw something. Um, I just want to point out in case anybody else didn't see it. I'm in pre-review, and documents not available in preview 1,029. And the only thing I've sent to review is 56 documents. So. Um, I wish we'd had tools like this when I was <laughs> I remember having whole conference rooms full of having a, a case that became five cases that was consolidated for discovery. It was construction litigation. And we represented one of the main defendants and there were like 120 parties and 80 law firms involved. And I had a whole conference room full of documents, depositions, paper, and lots and lots of duplicates and no one was allowed in that room except for me because I knew where everything was. I knew where the duplicates were and it was all paper. Like I, I wish we'd had tools like this 20 years ago. So anyway, I digress. I get excited about it. Because this would have made my life and my time so much easier and so much more efficient. Anyway, your turn. And that's what we want to do. So let me show you another way to just kind of get a grip on how much data you're, you're bringing over. So let's do a little experiment here. Let's go to our search button up at the top at the right hand and bring down the little, yeah, that guy right there. And let's go to do an advanced search. Now we're West and we, we do our, you know, our Boolean searches a, a, a very special way uh, to make things, you know, so easy as we're working through the data. We've done that with our advanced searching mechanism here as well. The first thing you want to do to start a new search is just decide what you're going to search on, Melissa. So let's get in that box and pull down and say, you know, let's search all content. We could search any of the fields available in here. We could do whatever we want. But I want to create, you know, a search with some ands in it. So uh, you know, we have ands, ors, and nots. Let's do some ands. So let's type in the word Enron. Okay. Now, for a seasoned searcher, they would just go about their business in this box and do their ands and ots and nors and whatever, um, you know, within five, all of the proximity searching they wanted to do. But let's say you're a novice and you want to be able to do Boolean searches, but you're not real confident about how you're doing them. Let's go ahead and just hit the plus sign up in the top right-hand corner, Melissa, to create this search. So now I'm going to select the type again, which is going to be everything. So this makes, you know, this tells people that they're going to search all content. And let's put an and in there as our connector. That's the second piece that you'll see. Okay. Yep. Doug, okay. You now let's, yep. Yep. Now let's search the word company. Okay. Now let's search one more thing. Let's go ahead and put the plus in. Let's search all content. Now you could do fields. You could do whatever you want to with any of these. And let's do another and, and let's do the word proposal. Okay, so we've built a Boolean search. So again, we could do this in the first box. You don't have to check any of those off. It's ready to go. And you can just hit, yep, you can just hit, actually, we want to, you're actually in review. Let's mm -hmm. do that again in, in pre-review. So go on over to pre-review. Okay. And go back on the same search. And search. Should, let me see. Okay. Oh, look, it pulls right up. Great. Yep. Okay. I was going to say, let me do it myself since you showed me the first time. Okay. Run, sir. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Now, look, we've got, is that 90 items? I'm on a very right. small screen. Right. We bring 90 items back? Right. No, that's a significant okay. question. Okay. So let's do this. Let's go to data assessment. Let's go ahead and clear that search. Go up in the top right-hand corner. You can go down and clear all, clear all of that. Now let's go back to our data assessment and let's run the same search, remembering that we got 90 items back, okay? So let's go over to the, the, all, the far right corner. One more, there you go. Mm -hmm. Now let's run a search report. So what you're going to do here is you're actually going to hit your search. You can hit, you can go ahead and put that in as Enron and company and proposal. Am I doing it now, right? You can actually do it all together. So you can actually get out of this one. Yeah, there you go. Just do them all together. Enron and company. Yep. Space in between and proposal. All right. Now let's hit the plus sign beside there. We're going to, you know, we could import uh, searches in here as well, but we've got this one and we're ready to go. So now let's run the report on that search. We're running the report. It'll take a second. That's a, you know, a Boolean search. You've got a couple of different uh, you know, unique um, terms within there that you can look at. Um, it's running that report to bring you the information. Now, remember, we brought 90 items back, but look at what we have now. If you look at our actual document search, it's 1,029. We've bought 90 documents back, but there are 36 family documents that are going to come along for the ride. So that may be um, it's probably or most likely attachments to emails that mm -hmm. are coming along for the ride. It'll actually show us how many non-matches we got as well. So at this point, I can take this search based on those terms, Enron and company and proposal, and I can send those directly to review. If you want to go ahead and do that, um, just uh, click, Melissa, just, you can do that. Or just send, so I don't have to click anything, I just click send to review? Send it to review, it's ready to go with those documents. Okay. It's going to make sure we're including those family members that are a part of that, uh, to make sure that they get over there, you know, with, with the rest of the data uh, that we've moved, but we've got a nice search. We could, you know, before we even moved it, maybe we go to our partnership and say, wow, we are really going to bring a lot of data back. Maybe we need to make our searches a little better. Maybe we need to pinpoint things a little more because we're getting so much data back. Based on so that data has been moved over now. And now we can go, you know, work through that data um, and, and we're, Basically, we've worked through a ton of data in a very short matter of time with a rookie, Melissa. I hate to keep calling you that, but it's been a while since you've done this. So you've done a fantastic job following along with me. Um, hey, Kyle, it, can I, hey, Kyle, can I ask a question? I hope, yeah. I hope that shows, you know, just the ease of use and how intuitive this product is uh, for people to bring data into review, not pay for that data that's in pre-review, but it's always there. And then we have a tool at the end of the day that can break up all of these matters, send that invoice information to your clients. Um, so, you know, you can pass that cost along through, but you have all of this great information that goes along with it. So I've been told to wrap it up uh, from this point. I think we, end, we ended right on time too. Um, so thank you very much, Melissa. Thank you, Roundtable. 